Have you ever wondered where some of these fantastic buildings that we see scattered throughout the greater western New York region come from? We're going to be learning about a very special building, a very unique story, in a moment on this week's version of the State of Greater Western New York Report, which of course is brought to you as is every week by... Each week our community makes history. Each week you make history. And each week there's only one source to turn to for the first take on history. You know what that is? Subscribe to the Sentinel right now to discover the history being made in your own backyard. The London Honey Lake Falls Lima Sentinel. More than just your news, it's your history. Welcome everyone to this edition of the State of Greater Western New York Report. Join us each episode as we discuss fantastic topics ranging from history to science to the strange and the wonderful, as well as the treasured spirit with which our region has infused America. We challenge you to consider all things Greater Western New York, from our region's very beginnings to how it inspires, how it empowers, and why it is so admired. Here's the host of the State of Greater Western New York Report, Chris Carosa. Welcome, everybody. I don't know how that happened, but it did. So we're going to go right back to here and look at this. We're starting all over again. Isn't that great? It's wonderful how things happen on live TV when we don't know exactly which button to push and something happens and you're left with an interesting and wonderful slap in the face oh there's some topical humor for you hey we've got a returning guest this week his name is bob emerson he's the historian of schuyler county and he's going to tell us a little bit about a story you you may have not heard of it's a very interesting story before we get into that bob tell us a little bit about yourself how you came to be the county historian and Maybe a little bit about your background. Well, the uh, county historian job became vacant in 2017, and uh, I'd been involved with the Historical Society, and I taught American history in uh, Newfield High School for 36 years, and so uh, I was kind of an obvious choice to fill the spot. So uh, that's how I got to be county historian. Um, and uh, I'm currently uh, retired from teaching, but I went back to school, and I'm going to Binghamton University working out. Oh, okay. So let's see. We're going to be talking about something called People's College, uh, a, a college that, well, I'll let you tell the story, but first, tell us how you got interested in this story. How did you first become aware of it? Well, the, the, um, uh, the, there's a building in Montour Falls today that's a New York State Fire Academy, but originally that was going to be his college. So it's a pretty imposing, large brick building. And um, I just thought it was an interesting story, the background of it, how, what the Peepa College was all about and how it got started. It was kind of a, a local myth and lore was that uh, Charles Cook, who was kind of the benefactor of the town of Havana, which is today Montour Falls, uh, was kind of the originator of the People's College and that uh, he ended up losing his land grant to Ezra Cornell in 1865, but he, and that he lost it only because he became ill after he suffered a stroke. But as I investigated the story, I, I found there's much more to it than that, that actually the college, uh, the push for the People's College precedes Charles Cook and his involvement. Well, that, that, uh, I was going to say, you know, what kind of research materials were you able to use? We're going back now into say the, the first half of the 19th century, you know, early 1800, well, not that early 18. Well, actually, how far back do you go with the research? Uh, actually, it kind of extends back into the 1830s uh, uh, because that's when there was, there was a lot of change going on in the country at the time. Uh, there was a, um, a, a rise of the idea of the common man with Jacksonian democracy being prevalent and a greater sense of equality. There was universal suffrage for white males. But also work is changing. Uh, it's moving from kind of an artisan republic where people work as apprentices and journeymen and so on to uh, wage labor. And uh, wage laborers felt that they were kind of losing out, that they were getting low pay and little opportunity and that the big business owners were making all the money. Uh, so uh, you see unions start to get started. And uh, just with this whole change in, in the world of work, uh, people wanted to, uh, workers wanted to see something more to benefit them. So. In did the that, 1840s, well, I was going to say, did that sort of precipitate this interest in creating a college in what was then called Havana, New York? 
Uh, well, uh, Havana kind of comes to it late. Uh, actually, the, the idea of the People's College gets started in the 1840s, around 1848. A guy named uh, uh, Harrison Howard, who was a carriage maker and cabinet maker in Buffalo, New York, uh, had this idea of forming a People's College where the sons of mechanics could go and get trained so they could have a, a better future. And uh, others got on board with it as well, like um, uh, Ted Peters, who was an agriculturist, and Horace Greeley, the newspaper man, got on board as well in the 1840s. And uh, Peters wanted to include not just mechanical education, but also agricultural education. And um, Greeley's contribution was he wanted to include not just the sons of mechanics, he wanted to include the daughters of mechanics as well. He wanted to be co-educational. And, uh, but they were looking for a place to, to put this college. And for a number of years, they were kind of debating where it should be located. And, um, uh, there were meetings at different places around the state uh, to decide where it should meet. Uh, one of them was in, uh, uh, in Rochester. I think there's a picture of a newspaper article uh, about the Rochester meeting that you have. Yeah, so they had various meetings trying to decide where we should locate this college and talking about what the college should be, what it should look like, and what kind of courses they should offer and so on. Um, and it's, it's not, and then in the early 1850s, around 1853, they start selling shares of stock to try and raise money uh, to uh, help finance establishing a college someplace. But there's a, a lot of rivalry between different communities about locating a college uh, in their community. A lot of people want to have it in their location. And then uh, in around 1855, Charles Cook of Havana uh, starts to get involved. He um, um, began to promise that he would donate $25,000, that he would provide land to have a farm, because you have to have a, a farm. If it's going to be an agricultural college, you have to have a working farm. And uh, he said he had the land, he would donate that. And uh, so he was going to put up $25,000 as well to help finance this project. And in uh, 1857, they have a big meeting in, uh, in Havana and Montour Falls. And uh, Cook kind of makes sure that, uh, that his town is the one that gets chosen at this meeting. He did a lot of wheeling and dealing uh, to make it happen. Uh, apparently, anybody who owned a share of stock had a, a vote in the decision. It didn't matter if you had you know, 1,000 shares of stock or five shares of stock. Uh, you only got one vote. So what Cook did is he had other people buy shares with money he provided so that they would have a vote as well. And he used this to try to influence uh, the, the choice of Havana as the site for the college. And in the end, it, it won by 710 votes that Havana would be the place uh, it would be located out of 3,000 votes that were cast. So Cook was able to get the college located in Havana. And um, he had a reason, a reason for that because he, had just organized Schuyler County. It was one of the last counties to be created in New York State. It was created in 1854. And um, he, he wanted Havana County. So what better thing than to have a college in your town to help ice the deal that maybe this would be chosen as the county seat for the county. So he really did a lot to engineer the choice of Havana as, as the place for the college. But Cook, did not have a real big background in education. I'm not sure he really even cared so much about it. He just wanted to have a college there to benefit his town. It was more about the economic impact than it was about the educational impact. And uh, he, he got his wish. He got the college located in the town like he wanted to. Let's talk a little bit about uh, a couple of things. First, if we go back to the letter, uh, the letter was much earlier than this. And it refers to the People's College as the People's College, but it also refers to it as the Greeley School. So is Horace Greeley that significant of a player in this that the newspaper would refer it as the, to the Greeley School? The Greeley School? Uh, yeah, he was very significant. He really was, was pushing for this, and he had a lot of influence as, uh, you know, as this newspaper publisher in New York City. So uh, he really was, was uh, very enthusiastic about this. He came quite often to 
uh, Havana, Montour Falls, and met with Cook and talked with him and stayed at the, uh, uh, the uh, hotel in Montour Falls that still stands today. Uh, so he was he was very, very, very involved in this. Yeah. So let's also now take a look at the, the actual location of it. I'm going to put the map back up here and we can talk about it. So Montour Falls was originally called Havana. And I think it's right. kind of funny given today's history that the People's College was going to be in Havana. But that's another story. When did Montour Falls get its new name? Uh, it changed its name in 1895, and that's another story I could probably come back on some other time and talk about uh, how that name change happened. Uh, it was very, very interesting uh, battle over that, and some really interesting things happened concerning it. Well, um, you can see... It, 1895 that he changed the name to Montour Falls. You can see on the map, Montour Falls is located just south of Watkins Glen. So it'll give you a sense of where Montour Falls is and where this college would be. Well, tell us more about the, the college itself and, and the building that actually got built. What were some of the ideas behind that originally and what actually came to pass in the building of it? Okay, well, the original building, which I believe you have a photo of, um, was uh, supposed to be, there it is, was supposed to be five stories high and it had a center uh, um, piece that was six stories high. It was supposed to have a dome on top made out of glass and iron, and that was going to be an observatory. Uh, Cook even had a telescope all set to put up there and everything. And the idea was that you would, you would have a working farm on the grounds of the college. You would have uh, rooms for students to stay, but you also would have shops for machinery. So it was basically a, a really hands-on kind of thing you're going to learn by doing. And um, they, they wanted them to learn courses in like chemistry and geology and natural philosophy, but also work every day to make something. In fact, they even considered making a product that they could sell to help finance the college as well. So it was a really hands-on kind of thing that they were proposing to do. So what did it end up looking like in the end? Well, in the end, it ended up becoming not quite as grand a building as, they, uh, as that drawing indicated. Uh, it, it ends up being only four stories high and uh, with a middle structure where it's five stories high. Um, or actually six stories high, excuse me. And they don't put the glass dome on there. They, they put this little cupola on top of it. Uh, and the, there were supposed to be wings on each side. So the wings on the side were supposed to be quite large. Uh, they ended up scaling those down quite a bit with the idea that they could always add on later. So the building ended up uh, somewhat smaller than what they had originally looked like. Let's compare them once again. There's the building with the wings on it, as originally intended. What were those little cupolas in the back there? Were they anything of significance? Uh, I'm not sure what they are. They they didn't get constructed, so I'm not sure what purpose they were supposed to serve. But and these wings, here. yeah, you these see how far how deep that wing extends on the, on the one side of the picture there. Right. That's only the wing. That's not the center part of the building. Right. No, no. Yeah. Okay. Right. So the yeah. and so the building ends up looking like this, and right. it's uh, uh, the cupola in the center. What did what did that ended up getting used for? It was mostly just a decorative thing. I don't know it was used for anything. But the, uh, uh, to the cupola. Ah, Today, I see. if you go in the building, it's all closed off. You can't do that. But. Right. So that's, uh, we're going to come back, we're going to take a break right now, uh, but when we come back, we're going to talk more about how the building is used today, and maybe a little bit about what happened, how did, how did Cornell get what it, get the grant instead of, uh, instead of the People's College. If you have a question, just go to the chat and ask the question, and I'll relay it over to Bob, and you know, if you have an interest in the building, or maybe a little bit about the history of this Anything else for Skyler County, for that matter? I'm sure he'll be happy to answer. So right now we'll take a break. We'll be back right after this. Through the mists of time, nature and man have both created and buried treasures beyond the imagination. With the ages, these riches slowly dissolve into mere myths until they are forever forgotten. 
But there are those brave souls who tirelessly cling to the truth, ever seeking to discover the undiscovered, to reveal what has always been there, to uncover the hidden gems of a land thought forsaken but loved by millions. Fifty Hidden Gems of Greater Western New York. Discover the secrets in your own backyard. Buy your copy now at 50hiddengems.com. Welcome back to the State of Greater Western New York Report. I'm Chris Gross, and this week's guest is Bob, uh, sorry, is Gary Emerson. I keep calling him Bob. I don't know why I call him Bob. Maybe Bob is just a, a good name for you, but you're not, your middle name is not Robert, is it? Maybe that's... No, it's not. <laughs> so, so Gary, uh, let's go back to the building because we just had a question come in. When was the building originally built? Uh, they started construction in 1858, and it wasn't finished until uh, kind of late 1862. And um, they uh, brought in stones, these huge foundation stones that were um, quite large, and they brought them from a quarry near Syracuse, and, uh, and then they built the made the brick on site. So the brick was all local. They had five brick molding machines they used to build to make the bricks to the building up. But um, yeah, it took a few years to complete the building because it is rather large. So was it so was it immediately used as a college, or was there still a process they had to go to to officially become a college? Well, it, by, by uh, 1863, they do start using it as a college. Um, they don't have their land grant just yet, but uh, they do start using it before uh, that happens. Um, so yes, it was used as soon as it was ready to go. So, so they're trying to get the land grant. Explain that process because a lot of people may not, not understand why it's important, what this land grant means in terms of becoming a well, the Morrill Act got passed during the Civil War, uh, created land grant colleges. So land out west that's owned by the federal government will be sold and that money would be given to the various states and they could establish land grant colleges, largely with the focus of teaching agricultural science. Uh, so if you got the land grant, you got a lot of money available to you to uh, finance your college. And um, they, they were able to get a land grant for the People's College uh, by 1863, uh, but uh, as we'll talk about, they, they weren't able to hang on to that land grant. They ended up losing it. Uh, but that was a key thing to, to get your college launched was to having that money available. So tell us a little bit more about how they got the land grant and then and then what happened after. Well, uh, first of all, the uh, the college had to have uh, someone kind of be its leader. So they, they cooked befriended a guy named Amos Brown from Ovid, New York, who had helped form an agricultural college there, but was not chosen to be its president like he wanted to be. So Cook brought in Amos Brown to be the president of um, the People's College. And um, Amos Brown uh, kind of befriended uh, Merrill and uh, knew about his act he was trying to get passed. And when it got passed, he and Merrill worked to get the land grant for the People's College. So the, that was given to them, uh, but there were some stipulations that were placed upon it as well. The, uh, the money goes to New York State. The state legislature was in control of this money, and they would decide you know, how it would be used. And they didn't really trust Charles Cook a whole lot. Um, they, they had some conditions they placed in order to grant this land grant money to the People's College. And uh, some of the conditions included that you had to have a 200-acre working farm you had to have at least 10 very qualified professors. Uh, you had to have room for about 250 students. And uh, you had to have, uh, like I said, you had to have a working farm. But the problem was that the, the college got started before they got the land grant and they really didn't have a working farm. It really wasn't very operational. They didn't have uh, enough professors, at least not enough who were very qualified. 
Um, and the other, other condition they placed on it is there was to be no lien on the property of the college. And the, the problem with that is Cook had a lien. He's the one that gave this land and, and the, the site of the building and so on. And uh, he had a lien on the building and, and, the, and the grounds. And he would not surrender that lien. And Amos Brown begged Cook to give up the lien so they could make this happen. And Cook just was very stubborn and he, and he wouldn't do it. And he kind of dug in his heels and he said he would not give any more money to the college. He would not give up the lien. And because of that, by 1865, they end up losing the land grant uh, to Ezra Cornell and Andrew White in Ithaca. And they end up establishing Cornell University. So 20 miles away in Ithaca, uh, you get Cornell University and it, it very nearly happened in Little Montour Falls. Uh, that town would have been very, very different today if uh, Cook had not been so stubborn and had the foresight to uh, push this thing through and, and get the land grant for the People's College, but he loses it. So after he loses it, what happens to the college? What happens to the building? And it's still it's still Havana at this point. Another thirty years before yes. it runs yeah. onto or falls. Yeah. So, so what happens? Oh, actually, what year did did Ithaca get Cornell, or did did the land grant move from People's College to Cornell? It was in eighteen sixty five that the land grant went to Cornell. So, uh, for two years they kept trying to hang on to it at Montour Falls, but they weren't able to do it. Uh, but Cook suffers a stroke in 1863 as well. He's a state senator at the time, and he suffers a stroke that's very debilitating. Uh, he recovers from it, but um, you know, people often say, "Well, if Cook just hadn't suffered that stroke, you know, they would have kept the land grant at People's College at, at Montour Falls." But uh, it, the problems actually started before he suffered the stroke. He was already being stubborn and not giving up the lien and. Uh, saying he wouldn't donate any more money. So I don't think a stroke alone was what caused it, but it certainly contributed to why he ends, ends up losing land grant. He's just not very healthy, and he's he's not willing to, to fight for it. And um, so he, he loses it, and then the uh, he has a second stroke in 1866 that he dies from, and his brother comes to town, Albert Cook, and uh, he turns the building into Cook Academy. It becomes a uh, like a prep school, and it will serve that purpose until the 1940s. And uh, Cook Academy used to have some pretty awesome sports teams. They they won championship, national championships in football and basketball for prep schools in the United States. So they had some really good sports teams that were really well known. Was this picture here from the Cook Academy years? That's from the Cook Academy years, yes. But um, that's what the building looked like when it was finished in 1862. So what happened that Cook Academy had to go away? Did they just lose students or? Uh, yeah, 1942, uh, World War II is going on. They don't have enough students. They're losing money and they, they just shut down. And uh, it becomes a uh, Lutheran seminary for a while. Um, but um, eventually it gets purchased and it becomes a New York State Academy of Fire Science, which is the purpose it still serves today. So today, firemen all across the state come to this place to learn how to deal with fires. So this is what the building looks like today. Uh, it's very similar, obviously, but it doesn't have that cupola anymore. What happened to the cupola? Uh, cupola just got damaged by lightning and storms over the years, and in 1920, they had to, they had to take the cupola down. Uh, another interesting story I'm looking into that I haven't been able to find the answer to yet, but there used to be a, a cannon right in front of the main entrance there that you see in the photograph. Uh, it was a 1812, uh, captured during the War of 1812 and brought to Montour Falls, and they put it there as a little monument with a flagpole. And uh, it, it, at some point, though, the cannon was taken down, and my understanding it was buried in front of the school somewhere, but we don't know where, and I, don't know, I haven't been able to find out when. But sometime in the 1930s, perhaps, uh, that cannon was taken down and buried. So is there, are, are there any tours or historical uh, events that uh, surround this building today? 
Um, not not so much because it's the fire academy. It's being used all the time, and uh, you can't just go waltzing into the place. Uh, you have to, you know, check in ahead of time, get permission to come in the building and look around and things. Uh, but there is a, a library in there who kind of is in charge of the history of the building and things. So uh, if you make an appointment, you can often go in and see it and talk to him, and he can tell you more about it. But uh, um, so if there's a uh... In terms of the history of People's College, is there, any, other than the building itself, is there any other remnants or, or uh, say, displays, collections regarding it? Does the, does the county have a historical you know, room where they, they keep all the old artifacts from the college? Uh, yes, the Montour Falls Library uh, has a uh, storage vault uh, where they archive things, and they have a number of things from from Cook Academy. They have um, old some of the trophies that they won. I mentioned they had great sports teams, so some of the trophies in basketball and football are there, and a lot of photographs of the teams. And the uh, Schuyler County Historical Society has many of the yearbooks from Cook Academy that you can look through and see the various students that went there and and so on. So there there are some things around that survive from Cook Academy. We just had another question come in. Is there is there anybody famous who came from Cook Academy? Oh, uh, uh, I can't think of anybody comes to mind right off the top of my head that people would probably know. But uh, um, I'm sure there are probably some people who who went on to become famous. So the uh, in terms of sending graduates to to colleges. Where did people who go to Cook Academy end up going? Do they do they go right into say farming, or do they go to universities or engineering? Is it, was there any sort of specialty that Cook Academy had? Um, I don't, I don't know if there's any kind of specialty that they that they had. I, I know you know people did a lot of those things you just mentioned. People went into engineering and and uh, other fields. Uh, so they they um. um you know, we're a, a school that offered a, a wide variety of different courses that uh, would allow you to go off into many different things. And they even had international students. There was a, a student that attended there from China. I don't remember his name, but uh, <laughs> uh, we still have some of his clothing at the Montour Library that he wore when he was at Cook Academy. So if the last year was 1940, there's still a chance that there are Cook Academy graduates out there. They'd be oh, in their yeah. late eighties or nineties. Yeah. When's the last um, time? When's the last time there was a Cook Academy reunion? Oh gosh, I couldn't tell you that, but they, <laughs> they did used to have them. You're right. Uh, I don't remember when the last one was, but uh, the numbers are so small now that they couldn't. But the, my first, the, uh, one of the first departments I lived in when we first got married, it was uh, uh, the, the landlord was a guy who who went to Cook Academy. He used to tell me stories about the place, and he ran track for them and. Went I was going to say, did he do sport? Maybe Cook Academy was a was the sports academy. Too bad we didn't have major league, uh, you know, sports the way we have today. Yeah, they sent people uh, right it, there. It kind of was. I mean, sports were a big thing there, and they they were very successful. Wow. Well, this has been really interesting, really fascinating about just the, the history of People's College and obviously what it became after that, and the fact that the original building is still there. That building is, yes. what, about 160, 170 years old now? Yeah, something uh, like that, yeah. Yeah, and it's, uh, I, I, people like to go into old buildings just to see what's going or, going on. And it, have you been, I'm assuming you've been into the building, correct? I've been in it a few times. They have a, a library in there. They have a, a chapel. There's a gymnasium. They have dorm rooms that the firemen stay in that originally was for the students going to the, Cook Academy, and uh, it's so, a really neat old building. So one thing that I do when I've ever gone into old buildings is I try to find the room that they haven't ever, or that they haven't used in a, in a long, long time. Are there any rooms like that, maybe an attic or something like that, that gives you a sense of what the building looked like, you know, a long, long time ago? Uh, I haven't been in them, but it's my understanding that there are some. Talking to the, the man who's the librarian there, he said there are some rooms on the upper stories that uh, uh, 
I think that people don't usually go in, but he said it's pretty neat to go in there. You can see, you know, some of the architecture, the building, the things in there. Wow. Well, Gary, thank you very much for being on today's show and telling us this really interesting story about something that maybe a lot of people don't know about and they could actually drive by and still see today. I want to thank everybody who's been watching today live. If you want to watch live, you are more than welcome to do that. All you need to do is go to stateof.greaterwesternewyork.com and sign up and you'll get an invitation. It's free. It doesn't cost anything. And you'll be invited to the show every Thursday morning. We'll tell you who the guest is. If it's something that you're interested in, you're more than welcome to come on board and watch and ask questions like we had today. Or if you're kind of busy, you work, you don't, you know, you're interested in the show, but you can't watch it live. Be sure to watch the replay. The replay occurs every Sunday at 1.30 on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. And if you can't wait till that, later this afternoon, by Thursday afternoon, Thursday evening, we'll post this show on our website so you can see it there. So once again, Gary, I want to thank you very much for coming on board. And again, everybody else who's been watching, you've been listening to the State of Greater Western New York Report. We'll see you next week. Thank you.